So uh, my name is Ray Kinsler. Um, I work on Fido CSIT. Um, I'm a software engineer working for Intel. I'm also a Fido TSC member. Uh, I should probably ask what a Fido TSC member is. Uh, back when I started on open source, you just flipped stuff onto SourceForge, and uh, that, that, that was that was open. This was before GitHub. And now we have oversight committees, we have marketing committees, and we have technical steering committees. And there's a technical steering committee for FIDO, and it's called uh, the, uh, the FIDO TSC. And I'm one of the representatives on the FIDO TSC. And we have input into the technical direction of FIDO. And FIDO um, is a collection of projects. FIDO is really three key things. FIDO is VPP, which you heard about earlier. Uh, VPP is a, is a high-performance network stack built uh, with the same kind of optimizations as DPDK. So DPDK is a, a very uh, efficient layer for I.O. FIDO, is a net, is, uh, FIDO VPP is a, series, is a network stack, is a series of protocol implementations on top of DPDK. So that's one part of FIDO. A second part of FIDO is the integrations it gives you. So, and you talked, you heard, uh, Ratislav talked about it earlier, and Giles talked about it earlier, and then you also heard Billy talk about the same thing, which are all of these integrations that sit on top of uh, DPDK. So with DPDK, uh, sorry, on top of FIDO. So with FIDO, we don't just flip a network stack out the door and say, you guys just kind of take care of yourselves. We take care of the integrations into Kubernetes, and we have so many integrations, you have guys arguing with each other about which is the best way to integrate FIDO with Kubernetes. And there's, I think, Billy's presentation called out very well. There's three different ways to achieve it, right? Uh, there's integrations with OpenStack. I think Giles talked about integrations with Open, uh, with StrongSwan, was it Giles? StrongSwan. And, and we have NetConf and Yang support. So we have all these integrations on top. So that's the second part of FIDO, is integrations. And the third piece of FIDO is what I'm going to talk about today, which is benchmarking. Now, usually, um, oh, I'll, I'll take a software. How many software engineers in the room? How many software engineers? How many test engineers in the room? One, <laughs> one two, three, four. OK, so that's probably like a, probably like a 20 to, there's probably like, it's probably like a 10 to 1. Uh, so in, CSIT is hugely important in FIDO. CSIT for FIDO is, is, is how we maintain and we ensure that the FIDO data plane's performance does not degrade over time. So what, and, I, and, and I'm not, you know, not, it's no commentary on any other open source project. But the danger when you move into open source is that when you get, when patches come in the door, you need a very, very, very tight and very elaborate CI and CD infrastructure to make sure that as you take new patches, that you're not trading off performance patch by patch by patch by patch. And that's the important role CSIT plays in FIDO. And it's a significant role. And that's what I'm going to talk through today. So what were the three key, three, three parts of FIDO? Three question, question? I know I'm picking on you. It's like 4 o'clock. And everybody's like, we've been to the bar already, Ray. You're asking us questions now. What are you doing? I said there was three parts of FIDO. One was the data plane, second piece was the what? Integrations, third piece was the benchmarking. This is the benchmarking. So today I'm going to talk about why code is not all, uh, no longer enough, and this is essentially why benchmarking is important. I'm going to talk a little bit about CSIT, what it is, and then we're going to talk, dig into three interesting problem statements with CSIT, or three new problems we're trying to solve with CSIT. Uh, and then I'm going to summary, have a bit of a summary. So today you heard about a number of different open source projects. You heard about SNAB from Luke. You heard about Open vSwitch from Kira and Bruce. Uh, what else? Have you heard about Fido from Giles and Raslav and Billy McFall. And you heard about Cilium and the, oh, who was presenting on Cilium? Oh, yes, gentlemen there. And then we have a, and then there's a, a, a few others that you may not have heard of. So there's a galaxy of open source projects. 
And if you want to learn more about the Galaxy of Open Source Projects, I'm giving a talk at 20 to 7. And if you're not already in the pub, you can come to the Lightning Talk room to learn about the, open, the, the, uh, the user space networking ecosystem. Uh, I'll probably just be presenting to myself. But uh, there's a Galaxy of Open Source Projects in user space today. There's never been more choice. But how will it perform for me? You know, you know, there's a whole bunch of typically vendor reports from either us, Intel, Mellanox produces them. There's lots of ARM produces them as well. There's a series of academic papers, there's blog posts, there's YouTube. But you always come back to the same set of questions. How are the benchmarking? Are the benchmarks repeatable? Are the tests quite applicable to my use case? And if I had a dollar or a euro for every time somebody said, yeah, but is it a real world use case? I'd be a very rich man, you know? And the difference between synthetic benchmarks versus real world use, I see Javier smiling there. Uh, are tests per platform and vendor neutral? And that's kind of an important one. To what extent are is vendors uh, you know, skewing, the, uh, skewing the, the game to their own interests. So these are all important questions. And they really all come back to how do you evaluate software data planes? How do you test and how do you ensure neutrality? Well, without data and without a consistent benchmark, you know, without data, you're just another pen, a person with an opinion. And, and, you know, this is from Edward Deming. And myself and Maciek chose this because I, th I think it kind of illustrates very well our sentiments towards CSIT. And again, it's not a criticism of anybody else, but it, it's, this is more of a statement of our intention. The intention of FIDO CSIT is to bring volumes of data that reflect the kind of performance you're going to get from a FIDO deployment in real world use cases. So to bring significant, to bring that kind of clarity so that when you're asking the question about how will it work for me that you'll have the kind of data that you need to answer those questions? How am I doing for time? Well, I'm doing okay. So FIDO CSIT is a sub-project inside FIDO. So if you go to the FIDO website and um, you, you navigate through, there's a whole bunch of sub-projects and there's one that's called uh, CSIT, CP, uh, CSIT CPL. CSIT stands for Continuum System, Test, uh, System and Integration Testing. I think that's right, yeah. That's my first fail of the day. <laughs> so what is FIDO CSIT? FIDO CSIT uses standard industry benchmarks and tools. So we, everybody's heard of RFC 2544. I think that RFC 2544 will be written on my epitaph when I die, okay? <laughs> Uh, or, or, and the, the Metro Ethernet forum standards, we test ranges of packets. We test 64 byte packets. We test uh, all, the, all the packet sizes up to 50 and 18. We test IMIX. We test uh, jumbo frames. So we test a large, uh, uh, not just one or two different sizes, we test all the different sizes you might possibly use, including jumbo frames. We use only open source tools. We use only open source tools. Our traffic generator is T-Rex, which just happens to be another FIDO project. We use the, everything's orchestrated and run by the test robot, uh, the robot test framework. And then we use Jenkins as the CI. So Jenkins takes care of running the nightly builds and running the tests and those kind of things. We test multi-core scaling. So, you know, we test with a single core. We test with two cores and we test with four cores. And sometimes we test with even more, and I'll talk with that, about that later on. We test, there's a typo here, we test NDR, which is non-drop rate. Non -drop rate. Um, sorry, when, NDR is when you don't drop packets. PDR, which is partial drop rate, I think we, we have a tolerance of 0.5% packet drop. And we test MRR. Who knows what MRR is? Maximum receive rate is where you throw the kitchen sink and you see how much actually gets through. Uh, we test the whole range of different network, fu uh, the whole range of uh, different network functions, things you might be likely to do, L2 switching, IPv4, IPv6 routing, ACL security groups, overlays, and we have a slew of unit functional and performance testing. Everything's open and fully documented test environment. I want to say that again, open and fully documented test environment. That means that, and we have lots of people who do this, we have lots of 
people who are involved in the FIDO community who actually go and clone everything and reproduce it internally because it's all open source. All the test cases are open source. All the tools are open source. You don't need any proprietary tools. So you can reproduce the whole thing internally. It supports Intel and ARM architecture, uh, ARM architectures. So what, do, what does that mean? We actually have an open lab that's hosted by the Linux Foundation that gets hardware contributions from people like Intel, from people like Melnox, from the, the ARM ecosystem. And we have a very sizable lab that's run inside the Linux Foundation that's free for anyone to, uh, involved in CSIT to use where all this stuff gets tested. And then that allows us to do lots of different permutations of tests. We can do the same test on different generations of Intel hardware. I'll talk about that later. Different, same test with different NICs. Same test on different platforms. Same test with an ARM platform. Same test with an Intel platform. It's the same test, very rigorous. It's the same test run through the same set of permutations. Different packet sizes, different numbers of cores, different platforms, different NICs to give you a very, very large corpus of data about how this thing for info, uh, uh, runs in the real world. Uh, it's multi-platform, multi-vendor, so we have it runs today on top of CentOS, uh, SUSE, uh, um, uh, Ubuntu, I think, I'm not sure about Fedora, I think that might be gone, but anyway. And then we also support cloud native. You've heard extensively about cloud native. It opens also, and cloud native is the hotness at the moment, I know. But it also supports OpenStack environments as well. Uh, and we also have support for some accelerators like crypto accelerators. So we have an open lab where everything gets tested in the open, where patches get tested, where nightly bills get tested where release reports get tested, all in an open lab in the Linux Foundation. And we own, use only open source tools and open source tests. So if you don't believe the numbers that are produced by the open lab, you can go reproduce the whole damn thing yourself and satisfy yourself that it's completely authentic. And that's, the idea is that we want to drive good practice and engineering disciplines at the, the FIDO dev community. So if you submit a patch to FIDO, and it causes a performance degradation, and we'll come on, we'll show you that later, it causes the performance degradation, an alarm bell goes off somewhere. And somebody sees that, and we can take action. So the idea is that by having this elaborate CI, CD environment, that we catch those kind of regressions early on. I'll talk more about that more in depth later. That we also, you know, when so much of FIDO and so much about user space networking is about performance or you know, achieving the best possible performance that you can through software. Well, again, FI, you know, FIDO CSIP provides you the kind of tool chains that you need to measure the performance. And then it also can prevent things like performance regressions. So it, it's all fully automated. It's integrated into, it's in, in, integrated into JIRIT so that when you submit a patch, all the tests get kicked off. Uh, we run functional tests, performance tests. Uh, we have use case driven test definitions, so if you want to do things like test things like VXLAN termination, those kind of things, we have test cases for that. And it all gets executed in the open environment. I've said all this and integrated with CI. I've said all this. That's fine. So what does this look like in practice? Now, clearly, um, you know, I, I did a count uh, last week to see how many test cases uh, in total I could, I could find. And I counted 998 test cases that are currently, now these are, these are performance benchmarks that are currently being run in FIDO CSIT on a regular basis. Now that's if you go through every permutation of packet size across every platform, across every NIC, across every microprocessor generation, across every use case. And you can see here that, you know, we actually break it out. There's 144 layer two tests, well, 216 layer three tests, 300, uh, you know, very, very significant number of test cases in each area. So when you go through all the different permutations of test cases across, uh, you, you come up with a very, very large number. I clearly sh can't show the result of a thousand test cases and it, uh, on one, uh, you know, at the same time. So I just picked one, in, one or two in particular that I quite like. So I quite like the IPv4 test case, IP4 routing test cases. So um, we have two test cases that we run. One's called IPv4 base that runs FIDO, um, that runs a performance test of IPv4 routing. 
with one route. So you've only got one route in your lookup table. And then we have IPv4 scale. And IPv4 scale runs with two million routes in your test in, in your in your in your routing table. And you can see this, this is a Haswell generation microprocessor. So we have two Intel platforms in the lab. We've got Haswell and we've got Skylake. And you can see the IPv4 base with one route gets around 11 million packets per second on Haswell. And then it gets, uh, with the two million routes, it gets, well, about 9 million packets per second on Haswell. Okay. So then we went to FIDO VPP 18, that was with 1804. We then went to 1807 on Haswell. And we did some software optimizations um, came along, and we also introduced the second NIC. So the software optimizations cause a small performance bump from about 11 million packet seconds to about 12 million packets a second for the million packets a second for the single route test case, and there's another small performance bump from about nine to nine and a half or something like that for the two million route test case. But then we were also at, that was these test cases here were with 10 gig NIC. We we're able to do the same test case now with the, um, the X710. And the X710, again, is a 10 gig NIC, but it's 4 by 10 gig. So it's a 40 gig NIC that's, um, uh, it's a 40 gig Ethernet controller that has 10, 4 by 10 gig physical uh, interfaces. And you can see here that you know, the performance is much the same as it is with the 10 gig, as with the 10 gig NIC. But now we have the satisfaction that we know that we're getting roughly, we're getting pretty much the same performance across a 10 gig NIC and a 40 gig NIC. Um, and then we introduced the Intel Skylake microarchitecture in FIDO 1807 as well. And you can see that performance again is roughly the same on Skylake. So we've also introduced a new microprocessor architecture. We've introduced a new uh, introduced a new NIC, and we have that warm, fuzzy feeling that performance is uh, more or less the same. And then FIDO VPP 1810 came along, and FIDO VPP 1810 made very liberal use of AVX 512 instructions. Now, uh, AVX 512 instructions, so I presume everybody knows, in the room knows what vector instructions are. Everybody knows vector instructions, I see nodding heads. And I see hands up. So AVX 512 is the latest um, uh, is a, is a latest improvement in vector instructions. So before this was AVX 2, which I think came out in Haswell, was it? AVX 2 was Haswell. AVX 512 is uh, on Skylake, which basically allows you to process even more packets simultaneously. Is the idea? So vector, what vector instructions typically do, or how we typically use vector instructions in both DPDK and FIDO VPP is we use them to process packets in parallel. So if you're using, let's say, a scalar instructions, you'd typically do a, one packet at a time. If you use vector instructions, you'd typically do four packets at a time. With AVX, AVX2, we typically did four packets at a time. With AVX512, we typically do eight packets at a time, if memory serves me correctly. And I hope I'm not wrong. <laughs> But what happened when we introduced all the AVX 512 optimizations into FIDO VPP on Skylake? You can see what happened to the baseline performance there. We went from well, about what, 12 million packets a second on 80, um, about 12 million packets a second up to something like 19 million packets a second, just simply by using this um, uh, by using this par inherent parallelism in the microprocessor that AVX gives you. Similarly, the scale test case with the 2 million routes went up from something like 9 million packets a second to something like over, um, this, you know, to over, um, to over 16 million, to around 16 million packets a second. So you can see here the general point, and I probably labored it now at this stage, but the general point is, you know, you can look at the same test case across a series of NICs and across a series of microprocessor revisions and see what the impact of both of, you know, uh, what the impact is without optimization, the impact of it is with optimization across a whole range of 19, nearly a thousand test cases. So this is how we bring a real breadth, depth, and predictability. What I mean by breadth is breadth of test cases, I mean depth of measurement, and I mean predictability. We do this for every patch, we do this nightly, we do this for every release, and we generate a huge corpus of data as a result. So, uh, I think I've got 10 minutes left. So I'm gonna talk very briefly about 
Yeah, there we go. <coughs> Let me draw, draw back for a minute. Any questions on what I've just said? Go ahead. Funny you should ask. Let me come on to that. <laughs> Any other questions? Go ahead. So no, actually, oh, nightly, nightly, nightly. Not every patch because that just becomes insane. To your point, right? You can do it every patch. Okay, sorry. Um, I'm just I'm being told. So um, you were asked. The question you're asking is how frequently we do run the entire test case. Yes. So uh, I, I come on to that in a bit of depth. So let me let me come to it. So um, we talked about this um, previously, which is the continuity problem, which is that. If you find performance regressions at release time, it's typically very expensive. Anybody here, and there's lots of software engineers in the room, if you have measure performance regression at release time, suddenly it's git bisect fun, right? <laughs> so you're typically running git bisect, and you're running the same test case, and it's typically very, very painful. Particularly, the rate of velocity of communities like DPDK and FIDO VPP, the rate of velocity is huge. It means that we have a huge input of patches. It means you really need a, a very strong safety net to catch performance regressions. So how do you maintain best-in-class performance? And how do you address the danger of creeping normality? And I think the more common name of creeping normality is boiled frog syndrome, where you're just things slowly degrade over time and you don't notice. Well, I have a pretty picture for you. So this is our performance trending timeline. So we published this, and all the developers have access to this. And you can see this is a whole bunch of L2 test cases here. You won't be able to read this, but I can show L2 bridge domains with one Mac, one, with one Mac address up to 100,000 Mac addresses. I think we actually might do an even a million MAC addresses. You know, it doesn't matter. But you get the idea that we have a whole series of L2 bridge domain test cases here from a single up scaling the whole way down to uh, 100,000 MAC, uh, MAC addresses in a single bridge. And we can see how that test case performs over time. And not only that, we're actually able to run it against what we know are, you know are good numbers and bad numbers. So we can say, OK, well, what's in the green and what's in the red? And we can make judgments. And you can see here the red circles are regress where regressions have happened and green circles are where performance improvements have happened. And this is a dashboard that the entire community has on a regular basis. This is how you generate a warm fuzzy feeling that you're not losing performance over time. And because I said earlier that we have a very, very large number of test cases, we have a very nice dashboard in which people can just log on and see whether performance is increasing, what's the short term percentage change, what's the long term percentage change what's the trending number of millions of packets per second, and is there how many regressions you're getting, how many outliers, and that kind of thing. Um, so what are the challenges here? And I think it, the two questions before outlined the challenges very well. We have a lot of tests. <laughs> and we have a limited number of physical platforms. And so you very, need to be very judicious about when you run. So the entire test suite definitely gets run every release. And we typically run the entire test suite on a, a nightly basis. But that consumes, uh, consumes, a, uh, consumes a lot of systems. When you submit a patch, we tend to be more judicious about how many test cases you, we run against any individual patch. Because that, you know, consume, that can really snarl up number of test resources. You know, this is not an unlimited we, lab we have. We're not an open source project with unlimited funds far from it. So we need to be very judicious about what we run and when. Um, yeah, um, and one of the challenges is how you get, how you can ensure you get coverage. So how you know that every patch is getting the kind of coverage, test case coverage it needs. Okay, I'm going to keep going. Deeper diving. So moving beyond the symptom. So I'm going to move past this and maybe onto, yeah, probably onto this slide. So. You know, I've kind of labored the point at this stage, and you know, you'd be forgiven for throwing rotten fruit at me at this stage. But I've labored the point at um, about you know how many benchmarks we have. But at a certain point, you need to move beyond just benchmarking the problem. You know, it, it, 
at a certain point, you need more data to try and um, to try and root cause the problem. It's 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 one thing telling you, you know, uh, with a number of software engineers in this room, you know that it's one thing telling me there's a performance re uh, uh, regression or there's a bug somewhere. But give me a clue, give me some sort of an idea as to what the actual underlying problem is. And you know, it's well known today that Linux ships with a whole bunch of tools that you can use for next level analysis of where performance regressions are coming from. You know, tools like Linux Perf. Uh, we also have things like PMU tools. For, okay, for pulling PMU stats from the microprocessor that tells you where cycles are being burned. And we actually also have very good introspection, actual instrumentation in FIDO VPP itself to tell you where cycles are being for, uh, burned. So what we're starting to do now is we're starting to use these tools, and again, they're all free and open source tools, to start to generate the next level of information. So when you go in and you see a performance regression now, you can actually drill down and get to the next level of detail and look at the graph pipeline in VPP. One of the, I think Giles there earlier talked about the VPP graph hierarchy. And you can see in the next level where cycles are being burned. And that interface and that data, again, is being generated and it's there. So when we get a performance regression, we don't just leave you hanging and say, hey, guys, there's a performance regression. Sorry. We give you the next level of data and say, actually, there's a performance regression in this graph node as, a as opposed to a, a system-wide performance regression. Uh, OK. And then with, lastly, we'll talk about service density. And this is you know, when I, we talk about real-world use cases. So you know, there's a lot, been a lot of discussion today about um, the cloud and cloud-native cloud deployments. But there isn't really a whole lot of data uh, around how data planes react to cloud-native deployments, or certainly not enough data around how, cloud, uh, how data, um, deployments react to cloud-native environments. So we've been doing some work to try and understand that better, and we've been compar comparing service densities for virtual machines as compared to containers. There's a lot of industry discussion at the moment, a lot of OPS discussion in the community around hey, containers are more efficient than virtual machines. Hans Hilpoo's heard that statement. Containers are more efficient than virtual machines. OK, lots of hands. But they're not secure. But they're not, well, there is that as well. But there is a, that's a, there's a lot of talk around that. But the, in my experience, there isn't, I haven't seen a whole lot of data to substantiate that. So what we've been doing in FIDO, again, is trying to put data behind that to understand what that looks like and then where the inflection point is. So we're, we have, we're, we're benchmarking today is we're benchmarking a VNF service chain where you have a whole, bunch, sorry, a whole bunch of virtual machines in a chain all connected by a vSwitch. And then we also have the same setup for as a container service chain. Again, a whole bunch of containers connected by a vSwitch. And then we also have a container pipeline where the container where you, you, you inject packet into the first container and then they just pass it to each other also to understand what a point-to-point -point performance looks like. So, and in that way, what we do, again, is we test with one, uh, sorry, one virtual machine on the switch. We test with two virtual machines, four virtual machines, eight virtual machines. We test with one container, two containers, four containers, eight containers. And then we, you know, we typically test again. You get the idea of labor to point across all the packet sizes, and we produce this kind of data that you can see here. That again, that illustrates very well where the inflection point is for, you know, where uh, when you start to get a, a switchover cost in performance from containers versus virtual machines. And I've got one minute left to go. So three problem statements that we're working on. Ensuring that you don't lose your performance um, as, your net, as your data plane evolves. Also, understanding where performance regressions are coming from are the next level of information. And then also, how, cloud, how data planes perform in a cloud-native environment. So that's the FIDO CSIP project. It's an open and welcoming project, um, and the same as every other open source project. Uh, there's, always, there's always plenty to do. So we'd love to love to see you turn up. Any questions? Okay, thank you very much.